Good morning, everyone. We would like to start today here in number 13 of the 181 period of sessions. The hearing was requested by civil society organizations to address the use of um, surveillance technologies and its impact on freedom of expression in the context of the pandemic in the region. I would like to welcome the members of civil society that are here. Also, we have a special guest that is Scott Campbell. He is a senior officer on technology and human rights of the OACHR. Today with me, we have first vice president and commissioner Julissa Mantilla, second vice president and commissioner Flavia Piovesan, and also commissioner Joel Hernandez, together with the rapporteur for freedom of expression, Pedro Vaca, and we have all the team uh, of the executive secretariat. Uh, they help us to prepare this virtual hearing. So I would like to welcome all of you and interpreters. Um, civil society will have 30 minutes to present and to make comments. After that, Scott Campbell will have 10 minutes to present. And after that, the commission will have up to 30 minutes. Let's hope that we don't take up all the time to make some comments and observations. And after that, we are going to give the floor to civil society organizations for another 20 minutes so they can answer the questions and the comments made by the commission. Please uh, unmute yourself, unmute yourselves uh, while you are not taking the floor. And once again, I would like to thank you all for being here. On the screen, you will see that there is a clock. I don't know if you can see it. it reads blue sky timer and uh, the clock will start running when you start to speak and after a certain period of time it will turn red so you are well aware of time as vanessa said you will have simultaneous interpretation and closed captioning if anybody needs them welcome everybody and thank you for requesting this hearing this is a very important issue for the commission you have the floor. Good morning, commissioners and rapporteur. My name is Maria Leone, and I'm a representative of CEGIL. And together with the other petition organizations, we requested this regional hearing so that the commission can make a, a, a priority the request of standards regarding technology or surveillance technology without the adequate scrutiny and their impact on human rights. This is a trend that is a concern at the global level. The states of the region are using these technologies to respond to several social challenges, including public security, the control of the borders, the response to the pandemic, the monitoring of social protests, access to public services, among others. Um, these technologies that can capture, store, and process and share personal data are used within public policies and public programs used for health or for security. These uh, are the reasons why they say that they are using these technologies. But we see that there is an illegitimate, uh, this relates to violations of freedom of expression. Sometimes people do not know that they are being watched and they are not informed of the impact of these measures. And therefore they, see their rights being violated and they have no access to justice. Several of our organizations have implemented a project regarding technologies created as a result of the pandemic. This information allows us to evaluate the impact on rights if necessary. We are also seeing that malware is being used together with other technologies by a state to monitor and surveil the electronic communications of human rights defenders, journalists, activists, and citizens. Apart from violating the right to privacy and freedom of expression, there is all, it's also a danger for the right to integrity and life of these people. Even though um, several bodies have expressed the importance of guaranteeing rights when using technology, Petitioners' organizations are really concerned because of the growth in the use of these technologies. And we see that the standards 
are not enough to prevent violations of human rights. So the Commission should create standards taking into consideration the modes in which states are using surveillance technologies. This is not a problem of the future. As the OACHR office has recognized, um, regarding the with regard to the use of technologies we cannot react late to the use of these technologies or to think that they are just used in a limited way because then we will have to face the consequences on human rights now my colleagues will show different examples that show the risk that these technologies imply if they are implemented without evaluation without transparency and without accountability thank you Good morning. My name is Luis Fernando Garcia. I'm the executive director of the R3D, that is a civil organization that works on the defense of human rights in the digital environment. We know that uh, technologies and surveillance technologies are using, uh, are being used uh, to violate rights. And sometimes the victims of those violations are not aware of the fact that their right to privacy is being violated. Surveillance technologies together with impunity guaranteed by the lack of effective mechanisms to prevent and to detect abuse of these tools. This creates the use of the, uh, this promotes the use of these technologies and it's to the threat detriment of human rights. We have the case of Mexico, for example, for over 15 years as a pretext to combat organized crime, the state has justify the use of illegal technologies that invade privacy. And they have spent a lot of money in order to uh, watch population without their permit. This has led to generalized corruption and illegal surveillance against civil society organizations perpetrated by state agents. And today there are several indicia that they are working together with the organized crime that they were supposed to be combating. Um, a good example has to do with the use of Pegasus, that is an espionage software that when it, after being install, installed in a mobile phone, allows for surveilling the target. It collects and stores any phone communication message, contact, phone or file that is stored in the device. It has the location of the phone. It records, every, records everything that is written on the phone and it allows for any, or it can enable the camera without permission. Even though Mexican authorities denied this for years, at least three authorities require the license for Pegasus, the Office of the Public uh, Prosecutor, or the CNI and the Mexican army um, are using this technology, even though that they have no legal authorization to do so. They uh, buy this through tender or through ghost companies. It is also documented that between 2014 and 2017, Pegasus was used to attack journalists, human rights defenders as the Centro Pro de H, that is one of the petitioners of this here. And we see that also um, political opponents and other um, citizens were used, even in the Atsosinapa case that is being investigated by the commission. Uh, for example, oh, in March 2017, one of the pers one person was murdered and he was allegedly attacked by Pegasus before. And we see that several members of the cabinet were uh, controlled or surveilled with Pegasus. The illegal use of Pegasus has been investigated uh, by journalists and by civil society organizations, but not by the state. After four years have elapsed from the first complaints, the state has not guaranteed the right to truth. We don't know the number of victims of Pegasus in, back in Mexico. Victims do not know the information that has been collected about them or how what is the relationship between the Mexican apparatus of surveillance and the alleged violations of human rights. We don't know the masterminds or the perpetrators of these violations. Uh, some agencies of the Mexican state uh, do not provide information reg regarding Pegasus. 
we know that Mexican authorities have hidden documents and have denied the use of the tool. In spite of all that I said, or the Office of the Public Prosecutor is investigating this, but no person has appeared before justice. We see that there is a repetition of the facts and we see that the consequences of surveillance are still present. And usually high of, uh, level officials in Mexico were victims of illegal surveillance, but the fact that society and victims are not able to identify the perpetrators of these effects, what we see is that it can be attacks to their physical integrity. And we know that the democracy and the institutions of the country are at risk. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues that will continue exploring this issue. Thank you, good morning, honorable commissioners, rapporteur. My name is Vladimir Cortez. I am representing Article 19, the section of Mexico and Central America. In recent years, the state of Mexico has expressed its firm commitment to human rights and has welcomed the recommendations made by Edison Lanzan uh, and other former um, special rapporteurs in order to establish a legal order to protect people when they see uh, their right to privacy violated. They conducted an independent investigation regarding the use of malware, including Pegasus, which was being used to uh, surveil human rights defenders and journalists. Um, President Obrador said that um, his government, unlike the previous governments, was not going to uh, watch the population. We need to uh, mention the thing rates or the easy catchers that are technologies that are used to collect data. And we know that the Office of the Public Prosecutor is using tools to collect information or private information. We know that the authorities have been using uh, the Pegasus software as well. Even though there should be some obligations in terms of transparency, in practice, those obligations are not enough and have not guaranteed transparency. The federal government has not given information regarding the use of Pegasus, which was uh, requested by uh, some of the offices. And it has not provided information regarding technical aspects and everything that has to do with the tenders and the processes of ad acquisition of the software. In November, the federal government presented a plan, a federal plan that is a document that shows the commitment in order to have democratic controls regarding the intervention of private communications. This is a commitment by the state of Mexico in order to adapt the regulatory frameworks regarding the use of technologies, access to preserve information. However, this process was interrupted because of changes in governmental entities and because of the lack of willingness of the Office of the Public Prosecutor. Even there are different dialogue and roundtable conversations with human rights defenders and there has been an agreement in order for these tools to continue use, being used by the government. Civil society has shown its concern and we are here to contribute to solving these issues that are very complex for democratic societies. Taking into consideration the work we do in order um, in the digital environment, we have promoted the creation of roundtables and partnerships with government agencies in order to provide them with an urgent perspective regarding how to respect human rights in the use of emerging technologies used for surveillance commissioners. We would like to call upon you to work together in order to create the safeguards that are necessary in order to prevent the um, misuse of technology. For example, it would be good to adopt measures regarding independent surveillance and the right to notify the person that is being affected. We need to stop any type of abuse in order to guarantee accountability. Without this, um, the abuse of surveillance technologies cannot be uh, stopped. And the civil society is here to collaborate with the commission and with the state of Mexico in order to start or to guarantee the non-repetition of these surveillance acts. 
in order to guarantee human rights, in order it would be good to have a national agenda to create the democratic protocols in order to protect the privacy of all citizens. If these issues are not address what we see that different surveillance technologies are being created without the necessary regulations. It's also possible to say that sometimes that Pegasus use, uh, has not been eradicated so far. So we know that we need to work together so that in a democratic society, the exercise of rights to freedom of expression, to privacy and to assembly are guaranteed. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. Good morning. It's a pleasure to greet all of you, honorable commissioners, rapporteur. I'm Jonathan Bog. I'm director of the FLIP. As my colleagues have said, we would like to say that the acquisition and use of technology by a st states is recurrent in the region, and there is no standard for that, and there is no comprehensive evaluation regarding its impact on human rights. This uh, has led to a normal misuse of surveillance technologies. We see that these situations are very serious in Colombia, and we see that these is, technologies are being um, illegally used by the armed forces. And therefore, personal information of users is being collected. And that, oh, what, the, what these technologies allow for is to classify all that information as well. And this leads to discrimination because of political reasons and also to political persecution. This is a threat to rights and to freedom of expression and of thought. The state has not established any controls regarding the acquisition of technologies that have a surveillance capacity. Uh, the misinformation and the protection of security in the cyberspace and the Ministry of Defense has uh, justified that cyber patrolling is another surveillance episode that has an impact uh, journalists, but this has not been recognized by the state of Colombia. On May the 6th, 2021, the Ministry of Defense uh, faked a cyber attack, and many entities appear in black, and they said that this was a blockage attack. And at the same time, they launched a campaign, uh, Colombia Mi Verdad, the campaign is to clarify the information that discredit the work of public officials. And this leads to chaos and violence. That is what they are saying. In the video or the kickoff video of the campaign, the Minister of Defense, they said that they were not target to a real attack and that this was everything created. And But they sustained the line before Congress before a commission that was created in order to evaluate intelligence and counterintelligence um, cases. This campaign led to the creation of an enemy, fake news. And what they were trying to do is to identify those people in the media that criticize the actions of public officials and public authorities especially after the general strike in Colombia in the, at the very beginning of the year. It's necessary to ask ourselves regarding the legitimate use of this campaign. And we need to pay attention to four aspects. Using the speech of public information, the state tries to justify the use of surveillance tools in order to restrict online speeches. What they do is use a false premise. All the information that is published in networks is public. That is not true. And sometimes some of this information could be sensitive. There is no legal uh, standard regarding um, these authorities that are in charge of conducting cyber patrolling. Uh, they, after presenting 
two petitions before nine authorities of the state. What we can say is that public authorities do not have clarity regarding the use of these technologies and how they can carry out these patrolling activities. There are these concepts such as cyber security, cyber threats and fake news are not well defined legally and there is no clarity regarding their scope. And also what we see is that there is no um, concepts and there is no clear um, structure regarding these concepts. And therefore their understanding or interpretation is subjective and ambiguous. And that is incompatible with in standards on restriction of freedom of expression or to prevent free, uh, restrictions of freedom of expression. We need that this also leads to decriminalization of fake news. And sometimes the Ministry of Defense create, says that this could be digital terrorism. Uh, but however, the public prosecutor office says that digital terrorism is a different thing. And this could risk the right to presumption of innocence of those that are being accused of committing these crimes. Also, these surveillance teams uh, are working in a context in which we see attacks against uh, journalists and activists. And the commission is well aware of this. And a year and a half of these surveillance teams actions were denounced, they are still impugned. We see that they are using massive technology um, that does not comply with legality, necessity, and proportionality norms that are internationally being recognized. The lack of regulations and controls regarding the processes and the tenders in order to acquire technologies to surveil uh, private communications, promotes corruption, um, hinders accountability and promotes violations. Thank you. And now I would like to give the floor to my colleague. Good morning, commissioners and uh, special rapporteur. I, as it was already said, the uh, exercise of surveillance technologies and cyber patrolling in Colombia, uh, we need to mention that the only mention to that uh, function has to do with an administrative act in 2015 that was assigned to the national police that um, allows identifying cyber threats against uh, citizens. This is not included in any legal uh, norm and there are no clear parameters on its execution or mechanisms for the uh, guarantee of rights for citizens. Between uh, April and May in Colombia, a report was presented by the Ministry of Defense um, in terms of uh, public force, the monitoring of fake news, and uh, military forces. Secondly, identification of cybernetic effects and uh, vandalism acts that is um, able to identify people. And these also helped identify nine research processes. I will focus on cyber patrolling and profiling in social media. About this, the commission mentioned that profiling people in social media as vandals and digital criminals. The Colombian state uh, stigmatizes and criminalizes and by acquiring massive um, capacities. Besides this, um, at the beginning of 2020, uh, journalist investigations uh, disclosed secret folders and against defenders of human rights. This was constituted based on uh, open source uh, technologies and intimidation. We um, also discovered that they hired uh, technologies to conduct monitoring of different interactions in on the internet. Among the uh, contractors, that company that supported the army in this uh, folders issue uh, was used. The, this is sensitive information and it goes beyond the description of the software uh, bot talks about uh, 
chasing after people through different digital channels, including social media, messenger systems, and other automized systems. There are other mechanisms for the public force to be in a different media spying people and even cross referring referencing information with open sources this is worrying for human rights and we need to have a discussion in terms of its legality um, surveillance tool without controls by the state this doesn't meet the fundamental rights of democratic uh, societies and um, this needs to be um, regarded the massive tools that Colombian state is acquiring um, brings the whole country to um, a violation of uh, intimacy and the right of protest and expression. The framework that needs to regulate this also needs to be examined. The state needs to guarantee access of internet to all people, but also the commissions not to intimidate, stigmatize, or uh, violate those who use the networks. What happened in Colombia is that digital political participation, the Colombian state uh, again reiterated its behavior of stigmatizing, criminalizing, and chasing after the, the digital um, environment. We also need to add the surveillance that is something that the state is uh, facilitating. I give the floor to my colleague. Good morning, commissioners and special rapporteur. I'm Maria Paz Canales. I represent Derechos Digitales, an organization that uh, works in Latin America. Uh, following the comments of my uh, colleagues, there's advanced technologies for um, the um, invasion of spaces of all uh, citizens. These are is conducted by private companies that use uh, surveillance technologies in the world. These technologies are deployed by an administrative way and without a democratic um, insurance, but they also bring consequences. These laws have been left behind, faced the advancement of technologies, and we request this commission to uh, discuss this and advance the use of these uh, technologies. What do we mean by surveillance technologies and the applicable rules? We've heard from our colleagues, but I want to uh, present a summary for the Commission to have a complete idea of what we mean. First, different uh, intelligence means to surveil and watch activists and human rights defenders without an updated uh, norms by the use of uh, intelligence surveillance softwares patrolling as they uh, have exposed about Colombia and Mexico, then different uh, intersection communications tools that are used by applying outdated uh, legislation. Third, um, data retention by internet providers that are used by government agencies. Fourth, the massive deployment of surveillance in public spaces. And fifth, uh, massive deployment in public spaces of biometric technologies, in particular face recognition. In addition to my previous colleagues' comments, I would like to focus on facial recognition technologies. This is a biometric technology that by means of the analysis of certain facial traits um, identifies a person. It requires three elements of means to capture images, uh, image analysis, and a database to run a comparison. The precision of the system will depend on the data available and the way in which algorithms have been trained to conduct those associations. Problems in any level can be translated in a failed recognition, arbitrary discriminations and false positives because of an impact on the exercise of rights. This is enhanced when the people subject to these technologies belong to vulnerable groups, such as women, dark colored people, or uh, transgender people. This also helps to social inclusion and uh, it doesn't help with due diligence and the 
due process of law. We've already recorded different errors that resulted in grave or serious consequences. Facial recognitions doesn't allow us to control our own faces and it's something that it's not able to be replaced if control is lost. Constant surveillance also promotes silencing and self-censorship. As the um, OHCHR and the Special Rapporteurship have recognized, when surveillance of public spaces is used, facial recognition erodes people's autonomies in favor of a system that looks for an absolute control. Uh, recent uh, research has identified 38 different facial recognition tools in the region since 2018, and it's a non-exhaustive investigation. 30 of these tools have been used for public use, 10 con um, control uh, different rights, and six of these tools have to do with the access of political and civil rights, such as the access to identification by the citizenship. More than 60% of cases don't have legal grounds that support the implementation of these technologies. And when there are norms, these are interpreted loosely by the uh, state agencies. The civil society organizations have resorted to justice to um, obtain more information on this. We found uh, legal examples in Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, and Peru, some other cases in Bolivia, Chile, and Ecuador that are not uh, brought to the courts are presented as an example. Thank you. Now I give the floor to my colleague for the closing of our petition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, based on everything we've exposed, the petitioner organizations request first for the commission to adhere with a public announcement to the request uh, regarding the prohibition of technologies that are not able to operate without uh, the appropriate standards and to request the use of uh, other technologies until other uh, safeguards are guaranteed. Two, to call upon states that the use of the surveillance technologies be adjusted to the respect of human rights and that any interference be included by law that um, uh, respects a legitimate goal. Three, that states are called upon to implement due diligence processes to those who deploy, develop, sell, exploit these surveillance technologies. A key element of due diligence must be the periodic uh, evaluation of the impact on human rights. Fourth, for a regional uh, process for consultation to be started, guiding the processes for acquisition and use of surveillance technologies based on transparency, legality, need and proportionality uh, principles that should be used by any tool for intelligence, police forces, or any public um, policies that regardless of the technologies used. Fifth, in regards to Mexico, that the state is uh, exhorted to make the hiring process transparent, to carry out a diligent uh, investigation, and to also carry out the necessary reforms to establish the control of the surveillance technologies in Mexico and offer technical assistance to the Mexican government. And lastly, regarding Colombia, for the state to be exhorted to uh, use uh, open source technologies, uh, fake contents, and the assignation of stigmatizing uh, qualifications to those who express themselves via the internet. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you very much, civil society organizations. Now I will give the floor to Mr. Scott Campbell from the office of the UNH are for 10 minutes, you have the floor. Madam President, commissioners, colleagues, uh, I'd like to start by warmly thanking the Inter-American Commission uh, for this opportunity to participate uh, in this very timely hearing. Uh, the impact of the surveillance industry on the right to freedom of expression 
is a pressing concern. And I think even more so as the COVID-19 pandemic has increased society's dependence on digital tools for so many aspects of our lives. I also, I would, I would like to thank and, and very much congratulate the civil society colleagues for the excellent presentations we, we've just heard. And I will pick up on uh, many of the important points that they, that they just made. Um, I, I think it goes without saying, when the right to privacy is undermined, the core space that is vital for individuals and groups to develop their opinions, to formulate their expression, and to associate themselves with others is also deeply compromised. In each and every authoritarian context, the right to privacy will always be a primary target for those who work to stifle dissent. And as we all know from our daily lives, surrounded by computers and smartphones and cameras, the opportunities for intrusion have expanded in unparalleled ways as our world has become increasingly digitalized. For this reason, the High Commissioner for Human Rights and many other UN human rights experts have repeatedly expressed alarm on the risks created by the thriving market of tools that increase the capacity of states and non-state actors to conduct surveillance around the world. The combination between fast evolving technologies and the lack of adequate legal instruments establishing minimum safeguards on the marketing and use of these tools has created a growing space for abusive practices. And many times this is with serious consequences for human rights defenders and journalists, including possibly some of those attending today's hearings. All these concerns were significantly reinforced in the pandemic context. Many states made heavy investments, expanding their use of technologies to track population movements and population interactions, ostensibly with the aim of tracking the disease and planning responses. But once again, many investments were made without the necessary transparency or due diligence assessing their potential negative impacts on human rights. We must be clear from the outset Today, the unprecedented level of surveillance across the globe by state and private actors is simply incompatible with human rights. And most of the world and probably most of us here today are largely unaware of the massive amount of information about our lives that is being collected, processed, used, and distributed. Thanks to the relentless work of academics, journalists, civil society actors, human rights defenders, many in this room, again, in this virtual room, our understanding of the pervasiveness of surveillance and its impact has expanded greatly just over the past few years. For our discussion today and picking up on some of the important points made by our civil society colleagues, I'd like to underline the impact of two commonly marketed tools, malware and facial recognition technologies. Concerning reports on the widespread use of malware in all regions leave no space for doubt today. Tools marketed allegedly for responding to complex security threats are also regular, regularly becoming weapons for intimidation, turning the phones of activists and journalists into real-time spying devices, and thanks in part to the complete opacity that accompanies the marketing and use of the malware. And many in this region, we're unfortunately not surprised by the latest revelations documenting the use of the Pegasus spyware commercialized by the NSO group in over 45 countries. Mexican organizations present in this hearing had raised the alarm on the use of Pegasus against journalists and defenders more than five years ago. The latest leaks only corroborated these concerns, indicating that around 15,000 Mexicans, including judges and authorities, were also targeted. Malware abuses uh, malware abuses are becoming increasingly frequent. In the days before the revelation on Pegasus, another report documented the impact of Kandaroo, a different spyware also purchased and used against civil society actors around the world. Similar security concerns are also fueling the purchase and rapid deployment of biometric recognition technology by law enforcement and national security agencies in all regions of the world. And once again, there's wide scope for abuse with strong chilling effects. In two recent reports, our High Commissioner for Human Rights voiced concerns on the use of facial recognition and other biometric surveillance tools. Among other aspects, she has highlighted that people feel discouraged from demonstrating in public places and freely expressing their views when they fear they could be identified and suffer negative consequences. 
The dramatic increase in the ability of state authorities to systematically identify and track individuals remotely can in fact fully undermine privacy, affecting the exercise of the rights to freedom of expression, of peaceful assembly, and of association, as well as a freedom of movement. And in addition to intimidation, concerns also exist on the erroneous identification of individuals and the reinforcement of discrimination patterns through the profiling of marginalized communities. So what steps can we take to avoid the escalation of these risks? The United Nations, through its human rights mechanisms and the Office of the High Commissioner, have already provided some very concrete immediate and longer term steps uh, that we can take and that may be useful in guiding our debates. First, the High Commissioner has called for a, moratori a moratorium on the sale and use of artificial intelligence systems that pose a serious risk to human rights until adequate safeguards are put in place. Second, we need better regulatory instruments. Pausing the rapid dissemination of surveillance tools should give space for states, for states to work on export, on export control regimes. It should also give them space to boost legal frameworks that can secure privacy. Thirdly, laws and policies must ensure human rights due diligence is systematically implemented. Identifying, preventing, and mitigating risks arising from the introduction of new technologies, particularly the specific risks for marginalized communities, is critical to avoid abuses. And finally, there must be accountability for identified abuses. This is particularly critical with regard to the recurrent revelations on malware abuse. States must investigate reported surveillance cases and victims must be informed and supported to seek redress. And companies need to ensure mechanisms are available to remediate those whose rights have been adversely impacted. As the High Commissioner recently noted, a surveillance technology market is dangerously flourished in the shadows, far from justice oversight and far from public scrutiny. And this had been both in authoritarian countries as well as in democracies. It's now urgent to shed light on the surveillance market and rein it, in, rein it in with robust regulation protecting the right to privacy. Vague justifications on pressing security concerns cannot be used to empower authorities to disproportionately suppress fundamental freedoms. Similarly, a careful screening is necessary for all tra tracking efforts that were promoted in the context of the pandemic. Special measures weakening privacy protection on the grounds of the public health emergency of the pandemic should also be reviewed and reversed unless there are well-established justifications. As we can clearly see with a long list of cases of journalists and activists targeted by malware attacks, the costs of an unregulated and widespread use of surveillance tools are clearly too high a price for our democracies to pay. Madam President, commissioners, colleagues, I thank you. Muchísimas gracias, señor Campbell, también por su... Thank you, Mr. Campbell, for your presentation. And again, I would like to thank civil society organizations who presented the different issues related to the theme of this hearing and regarding the situation in the different countries of the region. I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. I don't know if they have any questions or comments to make. I don't know if first Vice President Commissioner Mantilla would like to take the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning to all. I would like to greet my colleagues. And I would like first to thank all of you for being here, but also for the critical work that you are doing to follow up on this theme that is so important, so complex and so uh, current. I would like also to thank the um, rapporteur for freedom of expression that is monitoring the situation that has is so important for human rights. Um, I wanted to ask some questions, but first I would like to stress some uh, or to work on some items. First, um, I would like to know if there is any chance to establish a pattern, uh, everything that has to do with tenders and acquisition processes, for example, in the situation of Mexico, and I would like to know if, apart from uh, direct acquisitions, if you have identified cases of corruptions and cases of lack of transparency. And the other issue that was rated it, it has to do with the use of surveillance technologies by the armed forces. So 
In this regard, I would like to know uh, if there is a pattern that you can you, that you have established. And second, I would like to know if apart from legal actions being uh, initiated, I would like to know if there are any remedies at the level of institutions or legal institutions or instances in your countries. Uh, I would know. I would like to know if you have any information regarding uh, the creation of cyber police. Uh, I don't know if there is a department or a division in each of the police uh, agencies or uh, army agencies to investigate this. Also, I would like to identify the groups that are being targeted. We have journalists, we have political opponents, and I would like to know the specific situation of human rights defenders. And especially I would like to know about the situation of women and feminist organizations and why not. Uh, I would like to know if there are any cases of UN officials or OAS officials that are being targeted. Uh, have you identified any of these situations? Um, that's are my comments and I would like to reiterate my uh, uh, gratitude for the work that you are doing, that it's so important for the commission. Thank you, Commissioner Mantilla, Commissioner Piovesan, you have the floor now. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to start my presentation by greeting kindly all of you. And I would like to express my profound gratitude and my recognition for this dialogue and for this space. I would like to praise the initiative of the Special Rapporteurship for Freedom of Expression in order to summon all these people with so much expertise to promote this dialogue together with the UN uh, with regard to a topic or issue that it's very important for society is an emerging issue. I agree with uh, my colleagues that said that this issue is worsened by the pandemic, by our digital lives. It's an innovative and complex issue, as the first vice president was saying. We know that the use of technology presents opportunities, but also risks and threats. I also would like to create and to recognize the extraordinary work of the Special Rapporteurship for Freedom of Expression, who promoted, who has been promoting this dialogue on digital rights. I think that this is a key issue because we see an impact on the right to privacy and the right to freedom of expression and individual rights. I have three questions for you. The first has to do with facial recognition and profiling. I would like to know if there is a regional and global context of the use of technology of surveillance that is being used in an abusive or authoritarian way without transparency, without control, without accountability, uh, without any analysis regarding the impact of human rights. I was able to understand that the dissident voices uh, are being targeted, especially I understand that the main targets are activists, human rights defenders, journalists. So we know that there is an attempt to um, suppress any criticism, but I think it would be very important to have more information on differentiated approaches regarding the excess of cyber surveillance and this abuse of technology. I would like to know if we have a specific information about these people that are being targeted, especially with regard to those marginalized or vulnerable groups. I'm the special rapporteur for uh, LGBTI persons. And I know that there are some vulnerable groups such as Afro-descendants, women, and I would like to know uh, who are those that are being targeted and that belong to this marginalized groups. Second, um, I would like to say that the commission is monitoring the situation in Mexico and Colombia, but I would like to know if there is any legal files uh, sometimes, because I would like to know if these cases have uh, been dealt with by the justice systems. Uh, I would like to know that 
we have some jurisprudence, but I think that we should be able to have more information regarding litigation and especially in the area of accountability, especially by the legal systems at a domestic level. I would like to know the actions that they have taken. And I I also would like to praise the initiative to call up and the commission so that we take measures. This is a very important space because we are here having a constructive dialogue with civil society organizations and with the UN, all with a lot of expertise in the matter. And I hear that right now there is no adequate legal framework or regulatory framework for this. But in order to have input, in order to develop the necessary inter-American standards, I would like to know if there are any best practices in terms of regulatory frameworks or norms at a global level. I don't know if there are any European guidelines uh, taking into consideration the 200 countries that we have around the world. Do you have identified any best practices that could help this exercise of the commission so that we can draft the necessary standards. That would be a good step, a good starting point. We can work together in order to develop these standards uh, that will help uh, develop national practices. And I think that we need to work together also with the global system, the UN system. But that's what I wanted to say. We have two special uh, areas of emphasis. First, we need to focus on state duties, uh, the due diligence, and also to identify and also reparate and sanction and to uh, provide non-repetition guarantees. And I remember that during the period of sessions, uh, because of the initiative of Pedro Vaca, we have a hearing with experts and companies that was about digital rights. And I remember that one of the companies, technology companies that participated said that the commission should develop standards regarding uh, abolitive transparency. So we need to focus on state actors, but I think that we should also focus on technology companies. And maybe we should have into account the UN guidelines for human rights as well. Thank you, Commissioner Piavesan. Commissioner Joel Hernandez, you have the floor now. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to second this recognition to civil society organizations for bringing this up. That is so important. I would like to thank also Scott Campbell for also contributing uh, to the table by uh, sharing with us the pronouncements made by the High Commissioner. Um, I would like to thank him for these pronouncements. Um, nobody could ignore what is happening. We live in mirrors in technology and we are all exposed to this uh, interference in our privacy and we are also able to recognize the impact on human rights. This has been mentioned also by my colleagues, Commissioner Piovesan and Commissioner Mantilla. Now in this digital world, we are working on platforms that are insecure. There have been some questionings regarding the platform that we are using right now. And this will go on and on and will be a challenge in the future as well. The world now is digital because of the pandemic and it will continue uh, being digital in the future. And also this issue is related to one of my responsibilities in the commission. I'm in charge of the rapporteurship for human rights defenders. And what you have presented with uh, by quoting different national cases is the violation of the right to integrity and to security of human rights defenders and journalists. We are very concerned that human rights defenders are being targeted by profiling and by surveillance technologies. Once again, this is brought to our attention. Uh, the HIE and the Achosinapa mechanism members are being targeted. That's 
a huge concern that we have. Um, what Commissioner Piavesain is saying is very important. After your interventions, she is asking about uh, the legal proceedings at a domestic level. And this is not about the clarification of truth only, but we also should be prepared as commissioners to see that some of these cases eventually in the near future, uh, some of these cases may reach the commission in its supplementary role. And the commission should be very clear about that. We need to identify the standards that we are going to apply. So this hearing is very timely for the commission. And I'm sure that the special rapporteur Pedro Vaca uh, that has started to work in this matter I know that he will be helped a lot in order for the commission to be able to develop these standards so that the commission is able to resolve in these matters. Until the time comes, I would like to highlight what Mr. Campbell said. It's important that we advance on the creation of regulatory frameworks. This is a reality. The world is digital now. We depend on a tablet, on a smartphone in order to work every day, whether it's or uh, for our personal activities. And we need to be realistic. This legal or illegal interferences will continue to occur. And that's why it's so urgent that we develop regulatory frameworks at a domestic level, but also international standards. I think that this is a second role that the commission needs to play. And that is to help states develop these regulatory frameworks um, in order uh, to regulate this uh, type of technologies. That's all for me, Madam President, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Now I would like to give the floor to the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, Pedro Vaca. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet the commissioners and also Scott Campbell from the United Nations and also the organizations who are here today. I think that this is a very important conversation. And I think that we need to see this not as an issue for of the future, because this is a current issue. Um, it has to do with uh, the impact of human rights. And this is something that we think that is going to happen in the future, but it's happening right now. Uh, after all the information that we have received, I would like to say something. We have dedicated most of our time to analog violations of human rights, let's say but the information that the organizations have provided us with uh, allows us to see that we are seeing that technology can accelerate human rights violations in the analog world. I also would like to address this issue uh, by saying that this is a serious matter. And I think that the use of technology can also help us address the huge number of human rights violations we see across the region, because we see that some organizations are victims of vigilance or of surveillance tools. And it's good to have technology to be able to follow up on those violations. According to the work uh, of the special rapporteurship in 2017, is the year in which we have identified that there is a lot of violations uh, regarding surveillance and technology. There are several uh, themes that were mentioned that have to do with access to public information and transparency are related to the deployment of surveillance technology and the importance of uh, balance or democracy, democratic systems, also the impact on human rights and all these chain of uh, buyers and marketers, and that includes uh, software companies and the impact that they may have. And also we need to focus on the users. We know that the playing field is not 
equal. And we know that those people who are most vulnerable or more marginalized are the ones that suffer the most. Uh, their data are being used massively. But I think that uh, we need to promote the use of tools in order to promote the guarantee of human rights and not the violation of human rights. And I think that the information that we have received is an alarming because technology is right now facilitating human rights violations, is accelerating them, and that's a huge concern. Regarding some of the aspects uh, regarding the hearing in August this year, uh, the special rapporteurship uh, also um, had or expressed its views regarding the use of technologies at a public level and the safeguards that should be present. And we have uh, supported the commission with some working visits and our stance uh, had to do with uh, official targeting or labeling, especially when there are police uh, authorities or the army that consider some content is fake news. We see that the use of state agents of technology uh, could be a concern and several organizations have discussed this during the hearing. And I would like to say something else. If you have any information available that you are not going to be able to share today with us, please send that information in Britain taking into consideration that some years have elapsed uh, since 2017. And at the time we started to talk about the impact on the right to privacy because of these massive surveillance technologies. I think that there is a still a lack of connection between suppliers and states. They don't, do not consider that this is a human rights matter. I think that the stance of suppliers and the states when we talk that this is a problem to public security and, and this could promote crime. But what do you think about the reactions uh, of states and of suppliers or companies? This has to do with the design and with the marketing and of these software tools that are considered uh, surveillance tools. Uh, what is their position? What do you see? And second, I would like to know if you have any information regarding the use of face, facial recognition technologies and biometric use technologies here. And if, if you do not have information about this region, maybe you have information regarding the use of these two technologies in other regions of the world. That is important because the commission is needs to develop the standards. And we know that we don't have much information about that. And I would like to conclude uh, talking about the uh, system. We have the judicial power, we have the legislative power, and we have the human rights bodies. And I would like to know if this, um, branches of government are addressing this matter and what are the answers or the replies that you are receiving at the domestic level for many years they we know that there are some organizations that are trying to provide uh, or that there are some governments that are trying to provide tools so that the judiciary is prepared so it would be good to know how prepared domestic uh, bodies are for this situation. Thank you, Madam President. I'm, I'm at the disposal of the commission. Okay, so I will share the questions and then I would like to go back to something that Pedro mentioned and it has to do with providers and states and this question uh, as to whether they've uh, accepted that this is a human rights issue. It's very important that in this sort of dialogue we can involve companies and states to uh, come up with these standards that we've mentioned throughout our hearing. I think this is a challenge for us. And from this perspective, we need to consider all this and uh, information as to good practices that you have from self-regulation uh, rules, um, um, 
responsibility and accounting, it's important that we work on these things, recognizes some initiatives that consider these as a human rights issue. So I uh, go back to what Pedro pointed out and also what Commissioner Piovisan mentioned too. Now I would give the floor for 20 minutes to you so you can uh, attend all these issues. Thank you to the commissioners, to the special rapporteur for your comments and questions. We will try to address the points made and I will uh, particularly speak uh, on uh, topics related to corruption, uh, surveillance tools, and also the use of good practices and the opportunities there are in Mexico for the commission to use the Mexican case that I have to say is exceptional in terms of intervention by the nature of these type of technologies per se. Abuse instances are difficult to identify. They require a treatment that allows the detection of abuse cases. But it's also important to mention that detection of abuse cases is exceptional and is an opportunity we can't leave behind. In this sense, I would also like to say a bit more about what we've learned from the Mexican case and what opportunities it represents to um, give an example that could be replicated in the rest of the region. For example, in terms of corruption, it's no coincidence or decision by just one authority. We've de documented several cases about uh, hirings that where there are corruptions, overprices, ghost companies, etc. And this is because of the institutional design um, contracts in terms of surveillance tools um, are are ruled or are reversed by the Organization of National Security and certain rules are omitted. For example, tenders or the fact that authorities choose who they uh, contract with or what they contract. And this is kept under the secret of national security. This provides incentives for corruption because it allows excessive expenses in the use of tools because all elements are decided arbitrarily and this uh, allows for corruption. But also there is absence of the registration or regulation of who and what can be acquired. There are no records. Once the Pegasus case was known in Mexico for years and even up to date, we are still uncertain as to whether we've identified all the agencies that acquired Pegasus. There should be a clear documentation of who acquired which tools under which prices and also who used those tools. The Mexican state has dared uh, pointing out and in investigation processes um, before the Authority for the Protection of Data in Mexico, they uh, recognized and they've even renewed the use of Pegasus licenses, but at the same time, they argued they don't have use records. And they even said they didn't use it. I spent more than $40 million in uh, buying a license and renewing a license, but the state said, I never used it. If this is true, it's very serious. And if it's not, they are lying before the investigation authorities. We also need to mention how this um, brings consequences in the regulation and the need to remediate abuse cases. Because in order to start an investigation, there are obstacles to start investigating who to investigate. We don't know who was trained. For example, in Mexico, this is still uh, uncertain. We don't know who was, or who were the officials that used it, and they haven't been identified, and there are no possibilities, or there is no possibilities to come up with a, a result in that sense. 
So now I would like to give the floor to my colleagues to speak about the standards we need to implement. It is paramount that we have uh, standards that ensure that the use of these technologies can be kept under secrecy. Uh, accountability needs to be present faced with independent authorities. And it is worth mentioning, for example, the fact that in Mexico, the investigations have authorities that are arguing the national security exception that is typically made by the access to information by the public. For example, the public prosecutor officer or other uh, authorities have been denied information stating they are not able to disclose such information because of national security issues. So this is also very uh, problematic. And in this sense, there's a series of standards that we've uh, shared with the commission. And we also need to uh, underline the need we have in the Mexican case. And when we have those documented and there is no uncertainty, which most of the cases is not like that. And also we need to consider that the Mexican state three years ago had publicly said that they commit to implement this type of reforms and not to fall into the same practices despite the fact that the government has said that they want to implement and they have there's a political commitment to establish these standards this hasn't occurred in practice and we consider that the commission has a historical opportunity to lead a dialogue that could lead to the implementation of this type of measures at a regional level and we expect and we hope that the commission decides to implement it and the civil society will always be uh, willing to collaborate and help. I give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you, Luis Fernando. I would like to mention three aspects. Uh, also, um, going back to the questions that have been asked, I would like to say that in the past three years in Colombia, there have been three events that show the access to technology and the use of technology by the government. The first has to do with in the uh, armed forces, in the army, there was a unit in charge of monitoring and profiling hundreds of human rights defenders, among them more than 50 journalists, international and national. Second, a year ago, we knew that the president Ivan Duque had hired a company to categorize uh, social network users in positive, negative or neutral in terms of the comments they made on the social media. And third, the technologies are used to categorize based on the political comments or the expressions made by different users. And third, actually, uh, it, this is what I was mentioning during my presentation. It has to do with how uh, a campaign is being launched to categorize fake information attacking uh, public institutions. If we take all the common patterns from these three facts, and it would be naive to consider this as, as isolated cases, the fact that uh, bringing parameters to all these in terms of the context that are being known. Uh, what is the reaction that we can have? It looks like that uh, movie um, where the character already knows what's going to happen to him every day an impunity a road where no investigations will be carried out and we will not be able to advance because we need more independence to investigate state agents and recognize the state's responsibility because in all three cases that i'm mentioning responsibility has been on those agents who need to be under in investigation. I think this reinforces, um, as my colleagues have mentioned, the need 
that the Commission can uh, accompany these processes, because otherwise this uh, opens the road for impunity, which is very well known in the region and in Colombia. And finally, I would like to say that if we look at the set of actions that were carried out in Colombia, we see that the intention is to install this hatred towards institutions, and this will bring retaliations from the state and institutions. And I think this is similar to um, discretionality. We've seen this in Venezuela, we are seeing it in Nicaragua too, reflected in different laws and positions that look to criminalize and go after expressions that could um, affect institutions or are understood to affect institutions and stability from the state. Thank you. Hello, good morning. So also following what Mr. Campbell said, the pandemic has brought us to an increase in the use of uh, technology tools. And in the civil society, we've identified that the scrutiny is also lower because they are presented as needed to respond to a health or public health issue. We We'll also bring some other arguments after the hearing, but I would like to specifically say that the whole process for acquiring and implementing technologies lacks transparency and the necessary safeguards that can guarantee that no human rights are violated because they've been implemented very rapidly without a proper investigation and without supervision mechanisms. Something else is uh, accountability and uh, access to justice. This is seen in the lack of transparency and the treatment of the data collected. We've also identified the practice of dilating mechanisms such as uh, redirecting to other institutions, non-compliance with legal terms, extensions, and non-delivery of documents. This uh, brought different uh, complaints. This uh, also generates a burden, costs that could not always be afforded by uh, citizens. Surveillance is deepened in this content, and this is why we need for the Commission to develop standards that could allow for a process for safeguards and transparency and due diligence in that diligence in the processes. Thank you. Thank you. Now picking up on a few of the concerns that were left uh, from the questions uh, put by the commissioners, I would like to speak about the uh, judicial cases, uh, case law, the different focuses that um, Commissioner Piovisan asked, and the good practices. That's something that also some commissioners mentioned regarding differentiated uh, approaches, there's evidence as to the impacts that the use of these technologies have, particularly those that use uh, biometric recognition tools and others or facial recognition. This is why during my first presentation, I emphasized on the fact that we are not facing the impact of civil and political rights, where there's more development and more clarity for the exercise of these uh, political and civil rights. There are uh, direct impacts on the right to movement and assembly, but there are other deep rights that are being uh, impacted in terms of the exercise of economic, social, and cultural rights. This is emphasized with the pandemic, as Paloma was saying. In this context, the use of biometric tools has increased to control population. Uh, we have some studies published that we will attach as uh, part of the uh, background information to this hearing. They show how the use of biometric recognition bring um, further impacts in vulnerable groups such as women or transgender people. The Charisma Foundation has also um, presented a report on the use of these technologies and how 
um, this can bring suspicion in the delivery of social benefits. And this has to do with uh, fraud and the use of the state of this that could uh, harm or bring discriminatory practices for vulnerable groups. Therefore, we see there are different uh, elements. In the case of LGBTQ people, this has also been a concern mentioned by uh, Commissioner Pio Bissan. In Venezuela, we have a case in 2014, they've started implemented different biometric tools. And uh, in terms of case law and jurisprudence and what uh, actions have develop, been developed as an annex to this, we are going to attach a series of resources that are summarized that contain the links so you can also go deeper in the specific cases. What we see here is that there are no specific uh, resources for the claim of these type of uh, rights violations. They've uh, presented claims or complaints for the inconstitutionality, uh, administrative programs that have been questioned in terms of their compatibility with constitutional uh, mechanisms, and also the obligatory frameworks that need to be presented. The access to public information and transparency processes have also been mentioned to um, bring transparency to the acquisition and tenders. But they, this has encountered different barriers because there is no design and um, we don't have the necessary tools to understand the operation of this technology and understand the theory of the harm that's behind these cases. And this sometimes has failures because of the uh, reference of the state as the actor in charge of providing services. And there is a lack of supporting mechanisms that could define what is the proportionality that needs to be evaluated. And finally, the additional resources we will provide have to do with the good practices that are being conducted since 2000. Uh, 18, uh, Derechos Digitales has mapped what uh, regulations are in place. These studies need to be permanently updated. We will present it as a list of resources, but we've evolved a lot in some countries. In my first presentation, I referred to five categories, and I would ask you to go back to that. We will present all the materials. But regarding each of those technologies, we've had different regulatory developments and evolutions. And the last thing I want to mention is the call for moratoriums in the use of these technologies. These mechanisms need to be more specific and be aligned with uh, human rights protection uh, mechanisms. It, it is not cutting and pasting. What we recommend cutting and pasting is the call for the moratorium until the commission has time to pronounce and define the standard for our region. But it is also important to say that this moratorium is quite universal. It's been promoted from local governments and from uh, developed countries from the UN as um, the uh, representative of the OHCHR mentioned different uh, mechanisms and bodies also make reference to the moratorium. And we believe the commission needs to also join this uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in order to support what my colleagues said, what we would like for the commission is to follow up on what we are saying. We are going to share with you information and the information shows what we are facing, even though we don't have the processes to understand everything and to protect ourselves. But the use of these technologies is growing and is not illegal use by authoritarian states. But sometimes these technologies are used with the appearance of legitimacy. And that's why the commission should play a leading role in order to develop Inter-American standards that apart from emphasizing the 
principle of legality and proportionality, those standards should also include uh, due diligence uh, and impact evaluation as well. And that's why we would like to repeat again that the call for a moratorium and the prohibition of certain technologies should be a pronouncement of the commission. And it should be the starting point for a multi-stakeholder process of consultation in order to identify best practices and to build standards for the region. Thank you. Okay, thank you, all of you, not only for uh, bringing attention to this issue, but also for all the information that you are sharing with us. Uh, for the commissioners, this hearing is very important. Unfortunately, uh, taking into consideration the Inter-American Systems perspective, those are new issues, and it's great to have information from you that are experts in this issue. We are uh, taking note of all the things that you are saying. The Commission is starting to prepare its next strategic plan for its uh, for coming years, and this will include public consultations. And please, your contribution will be very important because this matter and this issue is already here and it's here to stay. And this is going to be a transversal issue and will include uh, the impact on different human rights. And your uh, perspective will be very important when we discuss the development of this uh, of the creation of the next strategic plan. And before closing, I would like to give the floor to Pedro Vaca so that he can comment on the actions that the special rapporteurship is taking. Um, because many of the things that you were requesting are being dealt by the dealt with by the special rapporteurship. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to say thank you, not only to the organizations that are here, but it's also important to say that the Special Rapporteurship is promoting an inter-American dialogue on freedom of expression and internet. What we see is a deterioration of the public debate, also the deficit of digital literacy that is fundamental for this here, and, and also to improve the playing field in terms of the knowledge uh, that the users have regarding these technologies and also content moderation on the internet. This is a dialogue that will last eight weeks. And after that, the special rapporteurship will create a working group in order to draft the recommendations. And we are going to present these uh, recommendations before the commission. Uh, in terms of the request regarding surveillance technologies, I would like to close my presentation uh, with a reflection. Right now, we cannot determine the number of victims and the number of violations of human rights. And this shows that we have a huge challenge again. And I think that it's important to have democratic and institutional safeguards. It's also important to protect citizens safeguards, the importance of journalism, the importance to promote as citizens that are well aware of what is happening uh, in order to pay attention because we need to deal with this capture or massive capture of data. Thank you, Pedro. And thank you all of you for all the information that you have shared with us during the hearing. As we have said before, this is a paramount issue, and we hope that we can continue working together with you and with other organizations. And we hope that the states and the companies can also get involved because this is a very important matter. We thank you for requesting the hearing and for having this hearing. And also would like to thank the presence of Scott Campbell that is representative of the OECHR. Have a nice day and we will stay in touch. Take care, goodbye.